Yeah, so welcome to uh, the course on technology and the future of medicine. Um, there, there's an interesting uh, mix of you. There are three graduate students, two undergraduate students, and a medical student. So that's what we have taking the course at the moment. Um, there may be more, there are other students who an interest. The idea behind the quiz you, you just took is to give me some idea of the baseline. The students uh, vary a lot in how much they know about the unusual subject matter of the course. And so it gives me a better idea of, of what level I should pitch things at. And uh, it also proves how much many of you learn in the course, which is kind of cool. So the objectives of this first lecture is to outline the basic plan for the course, the expectations, due dates, evaluation criteria, feedback mechanisms, and new features. To begin to introduce basic concepts like the technological singularity, exponential change, existential risk, and the accessible future. The accessible future means a uh, concept of the future that is easy to understand, that doesn't require you to read 17 books and work. Figure it out. Uh, we'll have to figure out, there are, there are a lot of sort of optional things for you that may surprise you. Like we have a dormant student group, and on Thursday you'll meet the potential president of this dormant student group. She has an awesome video about what the student group could be. But the student group is only useful if you guys want to do things out of regular class time. If you want to do some of the teaching and the presentations in a more party-like atmosphere with food and drink and entertainment and so on. You'll see that over the years we've done that about a third of the time. So some terms, everybody's got jobs and kids and all sorts of things that mean that they don't want to do anything outside of regular class time and they can't imagine why anyone would do that. But on, on the odd times that we do do that, it's a lot of fun and it's, it's an interesting way to, to uh, sort of uh, mix uh, entertainment and, and, and uh, learning. So, the um, student group, you may know that a University of Alberta student group has to have a budget, it has to have a bank account, it has to have money. So we, we have a small amount of money in the bank that could support these uh, social events related to the course. There is a um, very interesting guy, Nikolai Smith. He went to law school but never practiced law, which is true of a lot of people who go to law school, and he's a street performer. I don't think that happens to very many of law, law school graduates, but he is intellectually quite a, able to understand everything in the course, and so he's performed with uh, balloon animals, balance, beam, and uh, bullwhip. And the first time we, we did that, I thought this is much too primitive for this course and the students won't like it. But actually, the student sort of did like it. We've had him back two subsequent times, so he, he is an option if you decide that you want the student group and you want things outside of regular class time. There is also the question of where the extra people come from. They're not all TAs. A lot of people who take this course, it sort of converts them <laughs> to a way of thinking, and they keep coming back, and they keep coming even though they've already had the course once. The course is quite different every term because a course about the future cannot be static, right? I mean, it has to morph and change as, as thoughts about the future morph and change. And um, so there's also the fact that a lot of the most important things we have to teach you may not be that enjoyable to really listen to in a lecture format, things like artificial intelligence, safety, and regenerative medicine. 
And if you take an average audience that would not voluntarily go to a lecture on those subjects and put the same subjects in poetry and music, you can then entertain them in an evening and they learn the same stuff, but it's fun and, and cool and that sort of thing. So that's what we do between terms. It's called The Future and All, All That Jazz. And it's with uh, singer Mallory Chipman, a 23-year-old uh, singer and Edmonton's best poets, youth poets. And there's also the summer program in France, but that program can only accommodate four people. Already has four people for uh, 2020. Um, yeah, so as well. And ethics is pretty important every time. We have our ethicist, Gary Goldsand, who, who, who comes to many of our uh, sessions. Osmer Zayan is um, a computing science prof who is also strongly committed to the course, so they're sort of my backup for what happens here. So we have an 80 minute class period on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Each registered student takes on a special project of their own with guidance. The faculty presents the results both as a final paper and a final presentation. So the course is very heavily weighted toward that final uh, presentation and paper. It has to fit the course. It can't be like similar to some other course, because this course is not similar to any other course. So for instance, something that's just technology and medicine, but doesn't have any futuristic feel, doesn't fit. Something that's just sort of the history and future or something. No, it has to have that feeling of uh, exponential change, you know, machine replacement of human labor, uh, machines getting smarter than we are in 10 years and smarter than the whole aggregate human race in, in like 15 to 20 years. So th those are ideas that you've never given a presentation or a paper on. And so the, the, there's, there's a wide variety of things you can write on. You can write about the future of war, the future of medicine, uh, you may wonder how medical the course is. So the, the guiding um, idea of the course is medicine writ large. What will medicine be like when we've cured all common diseases? And so that, what will doctors do then? Well, it'll be human enhancement, not only physical, but moral, spiritual, and the human wish for that is sort of on ending. So that really broadens the subject matter. It, it means, first off, that you don't have to know a lot of medical terms to understand the uh, lectures in the course. And secondly, you can pick something that is related to human enhancement, that is not really related to uh, therapies or existing disease states, and that still fits the the course. And we have, have example presentations of um, previous students to help you with ideas. The idea of a mentor is if you feel sort of uncertain exactly how to structure your final presentation, you can get anybody who's ever taught in the course to help you with that, to give you ideas. Okay, so the summer Summer experience that is open. It's possible for you to go to France and to do what these people did. Uh, all three of these guys have been there, so they can tell you what it's like. But that wouldn't be possible to the summer of 2021, which is sort of a long time to wait. But anyway. uh, there's also potential paid work helping me do some of the things like video, green screens, and other things, not directly related to the course. So the, um, that final topic, the topic of the paper and the presentation have to be the same. Um, 
the the um, so the the presentation is thirty percent. The paper is forty percent. The midterm exam, which is not very mid, <laughs> toward the end of term on March twenty uh, fourth, is worth twenty percent in class participation. It's worth ten percent. Um, a lot of the, the rules for the course came from the students themselves, like marking you in class participation. That was something the students suggested because they felt that, for instance, students who don't show up for most of the sessions, it, it really lessens the positive uh, uh, experience for the other students and, and, and uh, so on. So that's why we do that. You can have three unexcused absences, but after that, it, it starts to be deducted. And it's okay. And so the subject matter has to relate to one of the main themes of the course. Um, sources for the images should be indicated, and if you turn in your work late, it's five points a day. Um, creating traditions over the past eight, nine years, we, we, we pretty much kept to this, and recently <laughs> the range of grades has been very small. It's been from B plus to A plus in the last term, from B to A plus in the previous term. There were some terms were the students who just came in and sort of coasted, and so they ended up with C's. But um, that doesn't happen very often, because the other students tend to be really interesting people, and so even if I don't stimulate your work in the course, they will. Um, so the medical student experience, the uh, elective is described as being 12 hours, so I think most of the stuff I've, I've said is not really required for the medical students, um, but optionally you could do something. I mean, you don't have to do a final presentation, but you could. You don't have to do a final paper, but you could. Yeah. So you, you can sort of, you know, define what it will be for you. Um, and the final determination of the grade, I recommend the grade and then there's a person much more experienced in grading students than me who suggests potential alterations, usually in an upward direction. We tend to, like if there are a bunch of students clustered very close and if one of them technically gets a lower grade, we, we tend to raise them so that everybody in the cluster gets the same grade. We've also been altering the, the midterm, um, adding points for everybody in the class, adding more points at the bottom than at the top, so that the highest grade in the midterm is uh, 99 and the lowest grade is something in, in an acceptable level. We've been doing that for a long time and nobody has you know, complained about it. So it, it, it seems for some groups of students that the midterm is relatively tough and so that's why we do that. But um, so we've added as much as like 50 points to the lowest grade and, and but at the top, we're often in this situation, maybe the top grade is actually the raw score is 91, so we add maybe um, eight points at the top and 50 at the bottom if, if the bottom student did <laughs> really, really badly. So, so um, it, it seems like an odd way to grade a midterm, but it makes sense for us, and that's what we've been doing for some time. So. It will also lessen your worry about the midterm because you're not facing, you know, an absolute 
equivalence between the raw score that you would get on it and the grade that you get on it. Okay, one of the main subjects in the course is the technological singularity, and that is what occurs as machine intelligence approaches human intelligence, and you're probably aware of in physics, the idea of a black hole and the uh, event horizon around a black hole and the uncertainty of, of predicting what happens there. So this is kind of like that, that, that we consider that it, it's impossible for us humans to think of what a world would be like when machines are really considerably smarter than not only individual humans, but the whole human race. So it's kind of similar to the uncertainty around the black hole. And also, once machines reach that point, they can self-improve very, very fast. So the, the moment that they're as smart as we are, the next moment they're much, much smarter. And they, they can you know, evolve much more quickly in theory than we can. This is one of the main ideas behind the course. You'll each develop your own way of explaining it to yourself and at parties and stuff. People will suddenly realize you know about this and they don't, so I should talk about it. And, and uh, so, um, but something very interesting of local interest has Happened. You may wonder, well, what about the timing of this? You know, what is it? So the the original idea was the technological singularity, where machines are as small or as smart as the whole aggregate human race was going to be in 2045. But some people questioned that and thought it could be sooner or later, or whatever. But Rich Sutton, who is a local um, AI expert who has quite a lot of international prominence, has recently predicted that it will occur in 2040. But it could be as early as 2030 and as late as 2050. But um, I think that's of some importance to us. He's a very prominent guy. He's taught in this course many times. You can see many past uh, videos. I don't think he's actually going to be teaching this term. So these are not just people that we don't know make, making these you know, projections that he, he, um, he's thought a lot about this and um, he thinks will be in uh, 2040. So you'll recognize both of those time points then, like 2029 when machines are as smart as individual humans. That's in just 10 years. So you'll all experience that and very soon. And 2040 is only 20 years. <laughs> so I mean, this is not something far off. This is something that like when um, 2030 occurs and 2040 occurs, you'll be thinking about this course and saying, well, how does life now compare to what we, we, we were told in that course? So anyway, so most people could be excused for not knowing anything about the technological singularity before February 2011, but in that month, two things happened. The singularity was on the cover of Time magazine, and the computer Watson um, beat the top human contenders in the TV game show Jeopardy. And that was a really important moment. It didn't prove that machines are smarter than humans in all ways, but at least in that way, in terms of answering questions the way one answers them on Jeopardy. Um, that was a moment. And it wasn't just that the computer was a little bit better. The, the computer did substantially better than the top human uh, player. The same thing has happened with the game of Go. 
When this occurred in 2011, people started talking about the game of Go and how complicated it was and uniquely human it was and, you know, that it would be a very long time before computers could master it. And they didn't even talk about what it would look like when computers mastered Go because they thought it would be so long. But it, it didn't take that long. So it occurred in like 2015, 2016, and uh, was a really major accomplishment for the AI researchers here because they had trained the people who were directly involved with that, and so it was really cool. And the beauty of the game, the way the game pieces are, are arranged and looked, completely different when, when the machine is playing versus the human playing. And it looks just much more beautiful and intriguing when you know, machines play. So, it, so it's very interesting as a kind of thought about is that a sort of metaphor for the, how all future life is going to be or is it just the game? You know? so, it, it, don't really know. So how did this course begin? That was sort of interesting. It, it began nine years ago in 2011. I did two focus groups. I thought, that's the way you do these things. You get people together in a room and you ask them what to do. So I did a focus group with undergraduates and then with graduate students. And it was kind of cool, the difference. The undergraduates just wanted to talk about grading. That was it. They wanted to know everything about grading. How are you going to grade? How are you going to grade this? How are you going to grade that? What are the grades going to be? You know. <laughs> Whereas the graduate students had such lofty ideas. They didn't care about grades at all. They just wanted to know how can we have major impact. So shouldn't it be true that the course is open to the general public? That sure, you can sign up for it on Bear Tracks. But also, you can just show up and sit and listen. And so we said, fine. And they also thought that it would be maybe life-changing for some people. If they start taking the course and then when the course ends, they say, oh, I want to keep on doing this. So they keep coming back and stuff. And that is a very real phenomenon. There is a student who shadowed me for a day when he was a um, senior in high school. And on the basis of that, he decided to start coming to the course while he was still in high school. And then he kept coming once he went to university. And during the summer, some of you may have experienced this, is the Pokemon Go craze here, here on uh, campus, he led a sort of famous chase of rare Pokemon and stuff like that. And he lectured in the course about that. We're very proud of, of the youth of many of our lecturers, but also the timeliness. That was a lecture that people were actually interested in. You, if you did a lecture on Pokemon Go today, it would be stupid. I mean, people just wouldn't be interested. But it was interesting. So um, over time, the course sessions have, have developed sort of rhythm. They don't always have to be like this, but maybe 50 minutes of formal presentation and then um, student discussion. Um, in the very early days of the course, um, no matter who was presenting, I would make comments afterwards, and it seemed like my comments were always more insightful than anyone else's. <laughs> and I wondered, this is such a stupid thing. And then it, it, at a moment in 2012, the student comments started to be more interesting than what I had to say. I thought, all right, this is what I've been looking for. And so then there are some terms where it seems like the students are sort of over-preparing for that. They, they all come to class with these little tiny speeches that give <laughs> And, you know, that doesn't have to have to happen. It's just a sort of funny thing that, that has happened in some terms. Like in 2017, you can see that. We had relatively few students. 
but they all had <laughs> these little speeches prepared for after the main presentation. So you can define what the course is going to be for this term. And it doesn't have to be like any other term that we've ever had. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it can be completely different. It should suit you, you know. It, it should suit your educational plan, your life, what, what would make this fun for you. And, and so that's one way to think about it. Now the camcorder, if you buy a Sony camcorder now, and if you look at the ad that caused you to buy it, or even the, the main description of the specifications of the thing, the fact that the camcorder automatically captures still images from the video stream won't be mentioned because it's so old. And it's of interest to almost nobody except me. But <laughs> since the beginning of the course, we've been doing that. And it's sort of, so that machine is deciding how interesting this teaching session is, right? It's sort of analyzing like uh, symmetrical smiles and cool hand gestures and high cheekbones and, you know, other things that only Sony knows exactly what this Sony smile shutter software is looking for. But like some teaching sessions, it only takes one or two pictures. Other times during that 80 minutes, it may take 200, 300. <laughs> it's sort of judging us by deciding how many pictures to take, how many still images to take as a part of the video stream. And if you think about this picture, like, for a human photographer to take that would be kind of hard because it's uncomfortable to hold your hands like that and so on. So this is a moment. You see, there's no delay whatsoever. Um, when the, um, the uh, camcorder sees something that fits that software algorithm, it can capture that immediately. It doesn't have to do anything. Just you know, it, it can it can instantaneously do that. So it it can capture a lot of cool moments in, in terms of what we're doing that a human uh, uh, photographer wouldn't. We started out in a room where the air air handling was louder than any of the presenters, and the lighting and the audio and everything was terrible. But people still had had a pretty good time. And then we ended up. In the CSIS, in a huge room that would hold over 300 people, and there's a little tiny cadre of people down front for many, many years. And then finally, Central University Registrar's Office became aware that we never had more than 22 students <laughs> registered for the course. <laughs> we're in this huge room that had all these bells and whistles of extra technological capability in, in that room, and they told us that we had to come here. We, we could not, even though those rooms aren't all that much used because they were planned for a university with many more um, students than we actually have. But yeah, so that's part, part of our uh, history. And for a long time, we, we were in a very big room. So the consequence of the student presentations can really be life-changing. I don't guarantee it, but for uh, Aisha Harian, um, it, it's kind of an interesting story. She um, kind of over-practiced for her presentation. She practiced it at home. She practiced it at school. She practiced it. <laughs> it was sort of too much practice. So as she's driving to campus on the day she's going to actually give the presentation, there was some red wine in the back seat of our car. Who knows why? <laughs> anyway, so, so she had some of that just before she came in to give the um, presentation. And the, the title is also very interesting. For a long time, I thought her faculty mentor suggested the title. 
So you, you know that Shakespeare has this phrase called this mortal coil. So he should, here she's talking about the immortal coil. But anyway, it turns out that that came from her boyfriend. But so she gives this presentation, which was pretty interesting. We put it up on YouTube, and three days later, gets this call from this awesome uh, computing company in uh, New York City that she never heard of, that they're looking for a director of social media, and they have seen this video of hers, and they think she'll be perfect. And so she went to New York City, and that sort of changed everything, and her, her, her future plans, and you just sort of built on that. Now, I, I'm not saying that's going to happen to any of you. It, it may not, but it is interesting. Um, some of you may have seen Jonathan White's first uh, presentation. It, it, it is on the main website for the course and, and so on. It begins in a kind of abrupt way. And the reason for that is that's not the way his presentation began at all. He began with a recorded song, Jonathan Colton's The Future Soon, which is a really cool song, but we didn't have the rights to. So I figured, I can't put up a video that starts with a recording that I, I don't have any authorization to. So I, I stripped that off and started afterwards. And this was frustrating for him because it seemed like such a perfect beginning. So late, later on when he did his uh, uh, TEDx talk, he brought that song back and sang it himself. So there, therefore, we didn't need any, uh, and and so you'll you'll find him actually doing that in this uh, TEDx. So just like um, Rich Sutton isn't teaching this term, uh, Jonathan White also isn't. But this part of his TEDx talk is a required part of the course, just like uh, um, Rich Sutton's ideas of what we should do when machines are um, more intelligent than we are. This is also a required part of the course. In uh, January 2015, there was a very high profile meeting about artificial intelligence safety in Puerto Rico. It didn't just have scientists and stuff, but it had reporters and media and <laughs> it was yeah, it, 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 it was really something. And of the 89 people there, 88 of them were planning to enslave sentient AI. When machines are smarter than we are, you keep it in a basement, you, 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 you chain it down, you, you prevent it from communicating with the outside world. And it was just, <laughs> think about that. I don't know if you think that slavery has ever been a like, like a successful strategy for uh, human beings, but particularly in this instance, I don't think that it will be when you're dealing with an entity that is more intelligent than you are, who may resent <laughs> the fact that you're, you're res restricting it in this way. So Rich Sutton was the only one arguing for the sentient AI, saying you have to treat it in a friendly manner, like you would any other you know, intelligent human that you meet, included in your circle of empathy, you know. Um, so lose your sense of entitlement. Lose this idea that humans must always be in charge of the Earth. Because if there's another group of sentient beings that's better at managing the Earth than we are, why, why, would, why should they be in charge, right? And include AIs in your circle of uh, empathy. So you're required to know this. And it, it's sort of part of the artificial intelligence history of the U of A. The, that happened. He was the only one arguing for this. He was the only one from the U of A at that meeting. And it was, it was kind of a moment. So um, 
The future in all that jazz, I've already mentioned AI safety and regenerative medicine, they're, they're both areas where um, they're, they're not really ideal section, um, subjects for a standard lecture, and we found that to incorporate those ideas into poetry and music is a really interesting way to get things across. We, we've done that internationally. We, we did it in London, uh, UK, to a sort of sold out crowd. And what did they think we should do next? They thought we should be on Google Talks next. Well, the person who actually was on Google Talks next was Lady Gaga. And I, I, just, <laughs> I didn't feel I was ready for <laughs> Google Talks. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So I guess I'm, I'm just trying to give you an idea that this course can be for you just another course. That would be perfectly fine. You, you can approach it just like any other course. But it does have a, continue, a, a considerable life beyond the, this uh, classroom going in many different directions. Uh, the course website ha has most of the past lectures for the course. Um, and there are uh, over 1,200 videos now. Um, so there, there's quite a lot of uh, content there. So the course content, uh, technological singularity, existential risks, artificial intelligence, uh, genomics, nanotech, uh, ethics is, is very important in, in, as part of every subject. Ways to optimize positive outcome for humanity and the co-evolution of humans and machines, the influence we can these considerations on medicine of the future. And uh, we have prominent people internationally teaching. Most lectures are not very medical. They're easily understood. Balanced view provided by incorporating both tech skeptics and tech advocates. I, I think that's quite important that you hear from a, a variety of points of view rather than just one. Now we're, we're sort of at a point where we're thinking of the long-term uh, future of the course and the value of the videos that we already have and that sort of thing. So some of the students associated with the course I think will develop an interest in that. And, and um, so that um, is quite, quite exciting for me to think that, that the course can kind of keep on in that way for uh, quite a long time. So the, this problem of audience heterogeneity, in other words, how to make the subject matter palatable to people you know a lot about technology, little about technology. We, we, uh, I think though if the people ideas presented are genuinely new and interesting, it should be able to satisfy both groups, a broad spectrum, and the most interesting aspects have a lot to do with the impact of technology on young people today, there's considerable youth orientation in the course, and the faculty are getting younger and younger. Uh, Shauna Pandya is finishing her medical training. Um, she's had a very interesting life. Uh, she's um, started her own company. She went to Singularity University, as I did, um, she trained in neurosurgery, now she's in family medicine, she's um, studied uh, medicine in extreme environments, like in space and under the sea and so on. And, and so, um, for many years she hasn't taught in this course, but she is teaching this term. 
And what's cool about that is the paper that we wrote in 2013 about the course, she was quite active in the course at that time, so there's a lot about her in that paper. And you will also get to know her quite well. And she was similar to you in age, and so it, it's, it's kind of cool, I think. Uh, similarly, um, Hannes uh, Schoblad, um, he, he will also be teaching. He, um, there, there's a sort of culture of people putting implants that uh, uh, identify them, so it's sort of like having keys that you want to take out of your pocket that this you know, implant identifies you as the person who should open the door and stuff like that. So, um, and the most futuristic part of the course is the um, quantum biology part. And, and that's been, been expanded. We started with one lecture and now we're up to four. And uh, also there was a student who gave a final presentation that the person who teaches that area, Jack, Tuzinski thought was actually better than some of his lectures, so that material has also been incorporated. So, so, and we're ahead of other entities that way. There are not a lot of other people teaching about quantum biology, quantum uh, medicine, and so I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud of that. Um, other innovations new in uh, 2020, um, participation in the Future Knowledge Jazz, related to the course. Uh, it's Tuesday night poetry. The subject of my poetry there is always the stuff of the course. So other people are talking about the usual poetic subjects of love and loss and self-image and all. I also listen to a poetry show every morning on the radio, the road home, so, and there's also the possibility of, of, of working for the course. Um, a lot of people who will encounter who have been doing that, Simon, Sarah, Emily, Gig, and Bikini, Jill, Amir, and Haiti. So I'm sure that this will become long. <laughs> okay. So, and you may think, well, this is the end of the strange and weird things and everything else. No, it, 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 it. the other thing is you can go to medical or surgical grand rounds. Um, and so that, that's on Friday morning. Um, so, um, and, and it, for most students, it is too early to get up, but there are unusual students who find it possible. Uh, Amir is one <laughs> such student. So anyway, so surgical grand rounds is at 7 a.m. and then medical uh, grand rounds is at 8. This is what's happening this Friday at medical uh, grand rounds. And um, so students who join me there, you'll always find that you are the youngest people in the room, and that's sort of cool. And it, they, they tend to be very interesting subjects of, of broad general interest. So the, these aren't things that you have to do, but they're things that you could do. Now for next time, um, Marcus Hutter is an AI researcher who sort of marches to the beat of a different drummer. Every AI researcher that I've ever met has said, he's not one of us. <laughs> and I, I, I'm kind of proud of his you know, contribution to the course. But what is also interesting is in every other instance where the, the external lecturer had the opportunity to directly interact with you guys, the external lecturer liked it, but he hated it. 
that one time that he interacted with his students, he wanted the video destroyed, so there's no record ever in, in the history of the world that he had ever done that, and, and so on. But anyway, so he has a more in-depth feeling about what the singularity will really be like, what it will look like, what it will sound like, most other AI researchers just say we don't know, you know, by definition it can't be defined. So, like he's saying that it will sound like white noise. If, if you are not a part of it, if you're viewing the people who have experienced the uh, singularity and you haven't, then it will sound like white noise. And uh, he also has some very interesting ideas about what will gradually happen to the world. Those, those ideas tend to be quite dark. And some of them, although you can read the words on the slide, you can't figure out the logic of how he came to that conclusion. And that's OK, because Jonathan Schaefer, the former dean of science told me that he thought that that PowerPoint was the most intellectually challenging PowerPoint he'd ever seen about this area. And he didn't understand how, how the students were really able to cope with it. So half of next time's lecture will be that. And so you'll, you'll end up with this, this sort of dysphoric moment halfway through. And then the second half, we're going to talk about light and fluffy and fun stuff, future day, how to celebrate the future, whether you want to do that. Future day is March 1st, which this year is a Sunday, but the Tuesday after that would be the third. So if you wanted to, do, to plan something for future day, we could plan it for March the 3rd. We don't have to do anything. Future Day is not a holiday anyone else you know will have heard of. And as we will discuss next time, the number of people talking about it has gradually gone down <laughs> over the time from uh, 2012 to now. That originally they were like 12 to 16 places in the world that were celebrating it. And I, I believe probably this year that this may be Melbourne, Australia, and us, and that's it. You know, so. so anyway. So dissemination of the ideas, how, how are we doing? So like the most popular videos on my YouTube channel are between five and 6,000 views. But the, um, the ideas of this course are very similar to the ideas of the uh, Big Bang Theory TV show. And they had 80 to 100 million viewers. So it, there, are, there are a lot of people that we're not reaching, right, that we could in, in, in theory. I'm, I'm not dissatisfied with our current reach, but you could think about ways in, in which we could try to reach more people with the ideas of the course. Um, so unfriendly AI is, is one challenge of the future. What if AI doesn't like us? But that's probably not a very likely scenario. A more likely scenario is uh, that it will just completely ignore us, right? Because it's so much smarter than we are. It's like if you pass an ant or a grasshopper or something on your way here, you didn't hold any ill will toward it. You just didn't think very much about it, right? So, so anyway, um, it's interesting thinking about what that would be like to live in a world where we're not the smartest beings around. Um, and <coughs> he um, feels that even if initially our biological brains come from something in our mental processes, very soon the processing power machine implant would vastly outstrip our biological brains. So in the long run, our biological brains become insignificant, regardless of the friendliness or unfriendliness of the AI. 
And we're stuck in the sort of dysphoric eternal youth. Now, I don't know if those of you who are experiencing youth at the moment feel it's dysphoric and that you don't have the power to control your own lives if you'd like. But there probably are some similarities with the prejudices and, and things that you face as a young person and the, what every human being will face when the surrounding machines are much smarter than we, we are. So you can imagine behavior that you might be, you might uh, engage in, like extreme risk taking, because we can back ourselves up from backups if something bad happens. This feeling of insignificance, lack of identity. Why wait to create backups when we can have the processes, the processing power to run several lives at once? So there could be the biological you, but then you can have a virtual avatar that can do many of the same things you can do, and that can, you know, uh, can re-establish itself in. Uh, some distant place without having to fly there on an airplane the way you would have to and so on. So, uh, and the, the world may have very little incentive to keep identities straight when biological brains contribute so little to mental processes. Bigger is not better. So it could be aimlessness, a lack of sense of purpose. And one of the purposes of this course is trying to, to sort of conceptualize how we can make the future we're talking about be positive for the human race. Hello. Some of the scenarios we talk about in this course is bound to make you more prepared for the future when it actually occurs. So what I say is that it makes you street smart for the future. Um, and that uh, it, it has a kind of long-term uh, survival value from that point of view. <clears throat> So um, we, we all need to be engaged in ensuring a positive outcome for the human race. The future is ours to shape. We need to get busy doing that. Simple approaches needed to engage the general public in these matters. This course is a beginning attempt at achieving that. So seven years ago, the structure of things became much simpler. Because at that time, Singularity University bought up most of the other things that were sort of Singularity related. They, they don't own us, but they own most of the other things. So um, we, we, this course is kind of like one of the few independent entities not directly related to Singularity University. And the other thing that occurred, many of you are aware of this, you, you use every day devices that were made in China by the Foxconn uh, company on behalf of uh, uh, Apple or Samsung or other um, entities. That, that's where many of our phones are made. And they made the decision to replace uh, one million workers with one million robots. Uh, making the singularity <laughs> appear to be much nearer. But it didn't actually happen like that. They, they replaced about half of its workforce with robots, but not the one million predicted. Um, so what about <coughs> these changes and medicine in terms of diseases and what the future of medicine will be like? 
So we can eliminate all diseases and still have a terrible world, much worse than today. Could be the only diseases are those associated with bioterrorism, where only the bad guys have the antidotes, and stuff like that, right? Um, so the the um, that's another aspect of this to try to figure out what will the rules be when what physicians do is mainly enhancement, what kinds of enhancement will and will not be carried out, who, who is it going to be available to, uh, and what are the limits. Um, so 25, 2045 is, is only a short time from now. Many of you will still be working then. What will medical careers be like? So perhaps all natural diseases will be eliminated, leaving only man-made diseases. But that may leave as much for physicians to do as there is today. Challenging responses to bioterrorism and stem cell technologies. The focus of medicine probably no longer be disease at some point, but enhancement, which will extend beyond the physical to the moral and spiritual. And Social responsibility, in other words, improving society. I mean, that a, a lot of uh, disease states come from poverty and the things that poverty causes. So you can imagine that the social responsibility of medicine is an important aspect and one of the focuses of the course. And what Rudolf Virchow said in 1848 when he was 29, Almost all the quotes people have from him occurred <laughs> during that year. And he was 29. It's the curse of humanity that it learns to tolerate even the most horrible situations by habituation. Physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor. And the social problem should largely be solved by them. Now, you may not agree with that at all. It may seem to you, well, that's social work, or, you know, something. But the, the fact is that physicians are not planning to you know, address these things, but there will come a time when that will be the main thing that they do. That, um, you know, there, a lot of the common diseases we have today will either be easily treated or not occur at all. And so the question then will be what enhancements are we going to undertake? You know, doesn't everybody want to be smarter, faster, taller, you know, whatever, and more moral and more <laughs> spiritual and so on. So there's kind of no end to that. Okay, so how did this course come about? So in 2010, I became the only full-time university faculty member taking the Singularity University Executive course. Um, it's taken mainly by like uh, corporate CEOs and uh, entrepreneurs and government officials and so on. So I was really a statistical outlier. This is me there. Uh, but it, it, it was a really interesting experience. And it, in a lot of the experiences you ha have in life, you take like a course for 10 days. And, and your knowledge increases a little bit, there's a little blip, and gradually that blip just disappears into nothingness, right? But this really sort of changed me and started me thinking about creating the course. I've been arguing for new cross-disciplinary structures in universities, better prepare us for the future, and I was talking about this as if I expected someone else to do it, and I realized, well, maybe I should. Do it. So that's how the course began. Um, so it's interesting to think then, like when you wake up in the morning, maybe like the first things you think about are the regrets about the things you want to do you can't do and the things you want to have you can't have, right? But what about a world where neither one of those things are true, where any experience you want you can have that. Virtual reality is better than real. It can be shared with friends. You know, there's sort of no limit on 
on experiences and that valuable goods, the price of them could come down to practically zero. And so both of the limits that you wake up every day, maybe thinking about and things that you regret you can't do and you can't have, you would be able to do those things, you would be able to have those things. So that's a world of abundance. And the world you're familiar with is a world of scarcity, right? Where things are scarce and life is hard and so on. So, and for those of you that, that watch or listen to the news, and I realize that's unlikely to be everybody because there's two classes of people who don't watch the news today. Rich people, famous people, and young people. But, and, and so the news is getting shorter and shorter because they're trying to capture your interests. So like in the main CBC channels, the news used to be a three, three or four minutes. And then they realize that no young person in the world that has, has, the, has the interest in listening to that much news. So they're trying to bring it down to a point where you would actually listen. But anyway, um, it, it, it's really unclear which way things are going. But I can tell you, <laughs> there was a moment in the course, we had a very good friend of mine who taught in the course all, only once. And what he presented was the future of finance, but it was really about peak oil. And the simple message was the way the world is going to end is we're going to run out of oil, everybody will fight at, at that point, and we'll kill each other off, and that's the way the world will end. And I was so angry because that's like the opposite of what this course is all about. You know that the solar energy coming to the Earth is like many, many fold greater than the, the Earth's to total energy needs and stuff. So there's no way that we are totally dependent upon the oil. But it is one way to think about things, right? So, and, and probably a lot of people around you uh, subconsciously believe in, in this idea of equal. That's the world that they've known. This is, you know, Alberta, and we've got a lot of interest in oil. So, yeah, but anyway. Um, so you may also wonder about aging. So is this course only going to talk about stopping aging? Well, what about reversing aging? Because that is also, in theory, possible. Uh, <coughs> so that, that, that is another feature of, of the uh, predicted future. And we need to consider the possibility of a post-scarcity world and what medicine would be like in such a singularity utopia. Um, so is it guaranteed that we'll end up there? No, it isn't. And um, you can imagine, like th this is like a world better probably than any world you've ever considered. But there's also the, the opposite, which is like, uh, you know, apocalypse is worse than anything you've ever considered. And both of those are possible, right? So I suppose one purpose of the course is we're trying to sort of nudge the, the, the future a little bit toward this, this positive uh, uh, utopia side and away from the negative uh, outcome. So Moore's Law, we will talk about this many, many times, but it's price performance of computing. It's an exponential curve. And it is what predicts that in 2029, um, machines will be as smart as individual humans, and in 2040, as uh, smart as the whole human race. Um, and this also needs to become something that you have your own way of talking about it. So it, the doubling is approximately every 18 months that the um, performance of um, uh, computing devices uh, is increasing at an exponential rate. So, 
It's a little muted in medicine. Why? Because medicine is heavily regulated. It, it, it doesn't work quite like other areas of tech. Um, so the, the um, reason that it's different in medicine, regulatory oversight, it is almost completely focused on compliance, discourages risk-taking and innovation. Healthcare doesn't have the same financial reward system focuses. Facebook isn't going to pay one billion dollars for the latest hot ticket item in imaging or medical informatics. Security always trumps information sharing. So better, faster linkages are constrained because of the security concerns, most of which are bogus. But you know, <laughs> the thing that's interesting to me personally, many of you have heard about Connect Care. Unless you, you've lived under a rock the past year, you, you've heard about the new um, clinical information system, which is province-wide. And so I, I'm, uh, I'm a Connect Care super user. I sort of teach other people how it works. And that rollout went particularly well. And like every single device that I have, I can you know connect now with in a completely secure way and have secure chat about um, patient care and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> what's on this slide is true, but the rollout that we had of this clinical information system suggests that there is some light at the at the end of the tunnel that what has been true before is that the communications physicians were using in their professional life was like decades behind what they were using in their personal life. You know, still leaving voicemail and using pagers and stuff that you wouldn't ever accept it, 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 as a part of organizing your social calendar, but it's the way, you know, physicians were routinely interacting. So now um, things are a little bit uh, in, 20, in 2004, I, I described a mega macroscope. You may know that my main job, day job, uses a microscope where I make small things very big, but there's also a need to make big things small enough that you can figure out what they're all, all about. Right? And uh, so it's interesting that IBM discovered the idea of the mega macroscope in uh, 2017, uh, like 13 years after I first talked about that. And hopefully you'll get both of those ideas in the course, that we're trying to make these really big picture ideas of where the world is going, where the universe is going, what's going to happen. You know, understandable, where you can actually figure out how that might work. How, how you sort of plan things. In. There are two new courses that started in 2018 that have content similar to ours, um, but they, they don't have many of the, the, the components we have. They, they don't have quantum uh, biology. The most interesting parts of our course are, are still missing from these areas. Um, so I welcome your suggestion of how to capture the imagination of the public, start everybody thinking about these matters. And um, so I welcome you to the course, and uh, I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Three, three minutes before <laughs> I'm sorry that I... I so long. Are there any questions that can be very practical? There are no stupid questions. Any questions you may have at this point would be fine. Okay, well, let me <laughs> ask one. Lakini Bat will be here on Thursday. She is enthusiastic about starting up the student group and getting you guys interested in that. Is that something you're interested in? Uh, do you like the I idea of having entertainment and food and drink and doing things outside of regular 
class time war is that just completely impractical when you consider your life in this course and you only want this course during a regular class period and it's, it's all well and good that we have this uh, um, student group related to the course but it's not practical this term. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Any feelings one way or the other? Yeah, I think you should do it. <laughs> you? Yeah. You would, That's a you good would idea. Like to do it? I yeah. think so, because it kind of um, puts current students and former students together in the same room, right? Yeah. That's your intention. Yeah. 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 So that's that's right. So the so the student group wouldn't have to be like all only or primarily made up of students taking the the course now. There's considerable cadre of um, students out there who, who have a history with a course in the last year, the year before, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so let, let's keep thinking about it. Um, what about other, were there parts of today's presentation that confused you or that you want to ask questions about? Was this what you expected? It was what you expected. Okay, well, that's good. So, okay. So then the other thing is your enthusiasm for future day. That's something to think about between now and Thursday. Does the idea of having a holiday to celebrate the future make sense to you, or is that like having a holiday to celebrate the sunrise or something? <laughs> it's kind of quirky and weird. And do you want to spend some time planning what, what Edmonton's going to do for Future Day 2020? Um, yeah, anyway, so something else. To do. So there will be additional students and people here on Thursday because the number of the students will only come on Thursday. Um, so you can meet some of the rest of this interesting group. Uh, uh, Rebecca met a whole bunch of them at a, at a dinner. <laughs> so some of the rest of those people. Any other questions, concerns? Okay. Great. Well, thanks for coming, and we'll see.